to a well-designed business. My name is Luann Nigara, and I'm so glad you found this podcast. Together with my husband, Vince, and our partner, Bill, we have grown our company, Window Works, from the ground up. So I know and I understand the challenges you face in running your interior design business. I also know that your talent alone isn't enough to ensure your success. So on this podcast, we talk about strategies and practical steps to help you grow your business. But make no mistake about it, we have our share of fun here too, mixed in with those aha moments that I love so much. This isn't fluff. Nobody has time for that. Whether you are a new interior designer or a seasoned designer, I am here to help you create and to manage the kind of interior design firm that you dream of. It's straight talk and it's action. Are you ready? Let's get started. Welcome to another episode of A Well-Designed Business. On the show today, we have a friend from across the pond. Joe Buckerfield is with me. Joe is the designer and project manager for her firm, Your Space Living, located in South Wales. Joe was a furniture designer, and in 2012, the company she was working for unexpectedly went out of business. She wanted to make sure that all of the clients who had been abandoned, left with unfinished projects, still got their dream homes. And that That's when Your Space Living was born. Working tirelessly and out of pocket for six months, Joe and her husband, Mike, completed every project and in the process laid the foundation of the successful company that they run today. Today, Joe and I talk about how from the beginning they focused on creating personal, enjoyable, and memorable experiences for all of their clients. And according to her, this is what sets them apart from other companies. Listen as we talk about the attitude toward kitchen designers in the UK today and how Joe and her husband go straight at their ideal client, rising above the stereotype for kitchen designers in the UK. It's a conversation we have had here on the show, but never in quite this way before. I think you'll enjoy it and I hope it will inspire you to go against the grain and to stand in your value. One thing you will hear in the show is, again, the power of niching your interior design business, of creating your you, of standing out. Well, maybe your you is being a color expert. Our sponsor, Camp Chroma, can help you stand apart from the crowd. As a certified color strategist, you will have a unique, evidence-based approach to color to offer your clients. Master the practical application of extraordinary color expertise at Camp Chroma, your online color education resource. Go to campchroma.com to enroll now. And I'll just remind you, if you haven't listened to episode number 309, check out this show. Lori Sawaya, the founder of Camp Chroma, explains everything you need to know to decide if becoming a Camp Chroma color strategist is right for you. Alrighty, let's meet Joe Buckerfield. Hey, Joe, thanks so much for joining me on A Well-Designed Business today. Hi, Luann. It's lovely to be here. Yes. So, well, I'm going to just out you, Joe, and say you might not really think it's so lovely. I know. I know. I know. And I'm going to out you and tell you, tell everybody that your husband has been your champion and cheerleader and trying to get you on this podcast. And it hasn't been me that's been blocking. It's been you, right? Yeah. Sorry. (laughs) No. So I think it's absolutely so um, sweet and, and affirming how much confidence that your husband, Michael, has in you. He emailed me a couple of months back and he said that he listens to the show and he loves mm-hmm. the show, but he just said, my wife, Joe is an amazing designer here in the UK. And I think that she would bring so much value in being on your show. And then he lists all these things about you. It was just so absolutely, I was like, well, you had me at hello with that. Like, <laughs> stop. <laughs> Jerry Maguire. Yes. That's it. Right. So, yeah. but, um, and, and, and the thing is that, um, 
I do thank you, Joe, for coming on because I know that, you know, through discussion with Michael and yourself, mm-hmm. that it isn't your thing to do is to go out and be on an interview and you really would rather not do it and you wouldn't have done it if it wasn't at his insistence. So I'm, I'm grateful for you to come on the show because I do have a lot of listeners in the UK. So I have to give a shout out to Chloe right now. I don't know if you're familiar with Materialese uh, Designs in London there and Chloe is an avid podcast listener and she's a terrific supporter and uh, has become a good friend of mine through the podcast so you've got some I said to him I said we have a lot of listeners in the UK she should not be nervous (laughs) so you have your countrymen (laughs) cheering you on (laughs) so but here's the thing I also love that you know he was right that what is happening there in your design firm is a lesson that we have said over and over and over again on the podcast that you have to figure out what your you is and what it Definitely. is that you bring to the table right and yes. and so what you are is you are a full service interior designer but you lead with your kitchen design and that stems from a background in furniture design that you have and yes. that you do your kitchen design and very often once you're in knee deep in the middle of the kitchen renovation and the design then they start to say to you and can you do this and can you do that and we have said that a gub billion times on the podcast. Mm. So tell us a little bit about how that works for your interior design firm, Joe. Well, I, what I, what I would say is that we we're in a position now where a lot of our projects come from client referrals, which is great, which we've got a client referral system, um, which we set up uh, a good year ago, which is really, really working. So what tends to happen is I'm getting a lot of clients now that, that know what I do. And they give me a call and basically go around and discuss their needs. And it, it just devolves. So normally, because kitchens are the heart of the home, they are in the UK, they probably are in the US as well, that um, it just sort of stems from there. And then it just gets to a, gets to a point where I'm practically doing the whole house. Um, so I'm managing builders and electricians and plumbers and managing all the trades and going through step by step what needs to be doing and working out the, the logistics schedule. So it's evolved then to becoming a project manager. But um, my my passion is design. Um, mm. Absolutely love it, and I've been doing this for oh gosh, nearly twenty years now. Which you don't is look scary. old enough to be doing it twenty years. <laughs> which is really, mm. I think, because I'm sure I, when I when I say to people my age, and then I've got two two kids, it's just <laughs> they look at me as if no, and I'm right. like yes. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> um, more wrinkles now, more gray hairs, but yeah. So there's two things in there. So the first is just to restate what we have said 9,000 times here is that you are quite capable of doing full service interiors that you actually love doing all of the design that's related to a project, but your marketing and a lot of your message leads with the kitchen. And yes. so just saying it again, if you're new to the show, Listen to any Fred Burns episode, listen to any Nancy Ganskaufer episode where we talk about going in and leaning into a niche and Uh declaring your space there and understanding that if you look, you could declare a niche and live in kitchen design only. That's a totally valuable niche. But what we find resistance sometimes, Joe, is with designers who are like, well, I really am good at kitchen design and I do enjoy doing it, but I like to do full service interiors as well. I don't want to be limited to kitchen design. So I'm a little concerned or afraid about leading so much with my talents and my projects in kitchen design. And Uh we're always trying to tell them, get in, get known, and then work the rest of the project. And you're you're expressing that that's exactly what works for your firm. Definitely. Mm. 100%. Yes. I love it. I love it. Mm. Okay. Now, the other thing you said in there is, and ah, this is new for me because I Mm -hmm. did not come across this and all of the information that Michael sent or that I gathered on my own, but you have set up a a client referral system. Yes. Tell us about that. As soon as you talk about systems, I'm in. (laughs) (laughs) I don't have many. (laughs) I'm still learning, believe me. Um, I, I think I think with with any design discipline, I, I think you're constantly learning. I, th- there's no way not mm. to. 
But what what we found was, um, especially with sort of the sixth year in, even though I've been doing this for 20 years, I've been employed before that. And I think that's a that's a massive start because you do build up contacts and you build up trade contacts as well. And the most important thing is you build up confidence. Mm. And that, that's a massive key of there's so many people that I've come across that just don't have any people skills. They just don't know how to talk to people. And it's 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 learning how they live and what their lifestyle is and what they actually want is, is, is a massive key. So the way I work, I build relationships up with my clients. I take the time to get to know them, to get to know their family. And I think if you are a volume sales business, then that's not actually going to work because you don't have the time to build or, or build a relationship or, or build a trust. Uh, but I've sort of set my business up into such a niche market that I've got the time to spend with people. And I think when you build up that trust with a customer, they turn into friends. Mm. So uh, I'm still in contact with clients I had five years ago and I'll send them a Christmas card. And, I'll, you know, and if it's their birthday, I'll send them a bunch of flowers and things like that. And um, and just those little things are a massive, massive key. So where we've developed then those relationships, those clients have now turned into what we call brand ambassadors. So they're out there telling their friends, their colleagues about what service they've had. So what we've done, we've come up with a system where we reward my clients. So if they pass on um, a friend or a colleague to me, and then I work on the project with them, then um, I'll send my client, my brand ambassador, vouchers from uh, a very very known department store um, where, where we are. And it's just like, wow, I'm being rewarded. So then wow. <laughs> they go and tell their friend and their friend and their friend because they, they're getting something back. And and when when I say vouchers, it's it's not a mean thing. You know, it's, it's like around a gift about card, right? That, yeah, but yeah. it's about 150 pounds, okay. vouchers, which I, I think is equivalent to maybe $200. Oh, okay, okay. Some, something around that. And as much as people think, oh, well, you know, where's that money coming from? That's actually coming from the profit of the business. Sure. That's not coming from the next client or, 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 or anything like that. That's actually coming from me. That's marketing because, money, really. It's yeah, a marketing it's, budget. It's, yep. Exactly. It's a massive marketing tool. And it is, and it's a genuine thank you. Mm. Um, they are my brand ambassadors. I've, I've, I've have one client at the moment that's given me six projects from six colleagues. Wow. She's getting a nice little wardrobe over there. Oh, she had a lovely <laughs> Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> she had a lovely Christmas this year. But huh. they, you know, most, I'd say practically all the projects that we work on, they are such fantastic people, fantastic families. So you do then go that extra mile and you want to give them the home that they've always dreamed of. Um, and it's just the thank you and the smiles when when it's all finished. And a lot of my clients turn around to me and sort of say, well, I'm going to really miss you. <laughs> I'm not going to see you tomorrow or next week. And, right, it, and, right. And then you, you sort of feel like you're going through a, a grieving a withdrawal. <laughs> yeah. Because you can spend six, well, you could spend three to six months on one project. Right. And you get to know them and then their daughter or their son turns up with their kids and then you get to know the grandkids. And uh, and it's such a personal service. Yeah. Um, it, I, I, and I think because it's such a stressful environment to be in half the time, <laughs> it just makes it so much more rewarding. Right. When it's so, uh, yeah. And I well. think with yeah, with any with any design discipline, I think you, you, you've got to love what you do. You have to. Right, um, right, right. And that comes across, I think, with clients. You, They can see the passion. They can see the enthusiasm and it gets them enthused as well. So it, it, it's quite nice because you see their eyes sort of glare up. Um, right. it's, it's a lovely process to go through. It's nice. And so is the, so you, when someone refers as someone, a new, a new prospective client calls your, your shop and they say, oh, blah, blah, blah. And you ask how they heard about them when they say the name. So <laughs> is, is it as simple as that, Joe, that you simply, you know, get another voucher, you put a gift card yeah. in the mail with a note yeah. and you pop it in the mail. That's as simple Sim as that. Yep. Simple as that. I just make a note of, um, you know, where the referrals come from. I've got two big, massive whiteboards in my my office that I've designed at home and um, it's just my notes. <laughs> now let me ask you a question. Do you only send it if the new client signs on or do you send it no matter what? 
No, otherwise I, <laughs> I think that'd be quite a lot of money going out. Right. No, it's it's only when and they they sign up that they want me to be involved in the project. Okay, okay, okay. I mean, had you ever considered uh, just a simple thank you card with no gift in it for when they send the referral and it doesn't turn into uh, a client? I mean, I'm just thinking out loud as we're talking because the, the the initial person did their job. They they were a brand ambassador for you, right? Mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll just it's make normally more an work email. For you. <laughs> yeah. It's, oh, an email. Yeah. So you send an email. Okay. So I send, that's I send yeah. an email to say thank you for. That's um, it. That works. So and so, yeah, com- coming in, you know, fingers crossed, and uh, yeah, okay, that, perfect. That okay, so you have that yeah. in place. I like that. Yes. Well, I have to say, it's it's you know what? It's funny is I think it's nice that you give such a valuable gift, um, and I guess in relation to the size of the work that it could potentially yes. turn into, it mm-hmm. it is still valuable. But you you get where you could come up with it. But it's so funny yeah. because I I'm going to tell you what my mm-hmm. daughter is uh, almost thirty years old, and when she was getting braces. Um, so what would she have been 12 something years old? Uh I will never forget. I mean, this is how long this is. I, I, we were getting, we were having her braces were on by a particular orthodontist. And then Uh one of her friends from school said, you know, she needed braces. And the mother said to me, Oh, who are you using? And I said, Oh, Uh X, Y, Z orthodontist. Oh, okay. Do you like them? Yep. Very great. Uh Blah, blah, blah. Well, like, um, I don't know, a month or so later, we got a, a, box of chocolate chip cookies in the mail. Now, I'm going to tell you what. You want to know your, you know, first of all, this is the thing that makes me the most happy and the most angry is chocolate chip cookies. Because <laughs> oh. I love cookies <laughs> but i hate when they're in my house <laughs> yeah, yeah but the we, thing we, we have a drawer <laughs> yes and so so but the thing is that i mean i how many times have i referred someone to another business i don't know mm-hmm. if i've gotten other thank yous not thank yous whatever it was but the thing was you get a thank you and a thank you is fine you get an email and an email is good and it's at the mm-hmm. least that you should do exactly but when i got those chocolate i mean i remember that like 15 years later 17 years later you know I was like, oh, and then I was like, who else can I refer to these people? Because, you know, it's not possible for me, possible for me to just go buy chocolate chip cookies. They're better if somebody sends them to me, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, tell you what I, I tell you what I also do. When, when, when I finish a project as well, um, you know, normally uh, the client just writes me a thank you card, which I never expect, but oh, it's, it's, so, it's so lovely to have, mm. which I put up in the studio. Mm. Um, but but also I use local businesses. Mm. So I have a fantastic company near me um, that makes her own infused gin and mm. vodka. Oh, oh. <laughs> you, you you mix it with prosecco and it's oh it's wow. just it's just to die for. And her business has evolved and she now has candles and the scent is just beautiful and bath salts and cream and things like that. So um, I have them in the studio so people can see and, and, and feel it. But I, but after every project, I give a hamper of all these bits and pieces and it's presented beautifully and it's, mm. it's in a black box with a big red ribbon. Um, and, you know, I turn up to the client's house and she's wrapped it beautifully for me as well. And they're opening and they go, oh, my God, what's this? And I just sort of say, it's just a thank you. It's a thank you for inviting me to be on your project, to be on your journey. And um, they and things like if I do a bedroom, there'll be a candle and maybe some joysticks and some cream. If I do a bathroom, it's sort of the bath salters. It's related to mm what room I'm doing so mm-hmm. whenever then they have friends or colleagues and they 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 go f- to the toilet <laughs> they can see <laughs> and, oh where did you get this oh I got it from Joe as a thank you and it sort of it, it starts the conversation as well and it keeps me in their mind right because it's a reminder of something that I've given them as a thank you yeah um, and again that comes off the marketing budget that's not there's nothing you know they don't pay for that no. that comes from me um, and it's a nice reminder. And there's also another local lady that makes this beautiful Welsh bread called Barra Breath. Mm. And she she sells her Barra Breath to a, a, an amazing department store in London. And she was spotted at a food, food festival. So, again, with kitchens, I always give them a, a, a Barra Breath. And it's beautiful, absolutely stunning. And, again, it's just 
wow, you know, try this with a nice cup of tea, a nice cup of coffee. And again, it's a reminder right. that I was there because from that point, I'm not there anymore. Right, 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 right. No, I mean, these are the little touches that do stay with us. You know, they really do. And it's uh, it's nice the way that you tie it into the local industry in your area and that you tie the theme into the room that you've completed for them. I, I think it's outstanding. I love it. I love it a lot. All righty. So, <laughs> so tell me about, um, you're expressing that the kitchen design industry, you're, you're feeling that is different a little in the UK than to the US. So I know I'll share to get us all up to speed that you were saying that it actually, I mean, M Michael shared with me, there's actually uh -huh. a website in the UK for like something like, you know, badkitchens.com or something where <laughs> yeah. everybody in the UK goes and like mm. posts their horror stories with yeah. um, bad kitchen design and retailers mm. and, and designers that are doing bad kitchens and not doing good service. So what happens then? It seems like to me the obvious thing for you is in your marketing and in your actual execution, you're leaning into that extra level and that extra care and value that you give by being an ethical interior designer and an ethical kitchen designer you want to tell us a little bit about that it, it, oh, where it's do a you big start? topic it's, i know right yeah yeah i just so, feel like so. i feel like you have let me maybe make it a little easier i feel okay. like that when i read about you i feel like Rather than be a person, this is this is the angle I'm going for, rather sure. than be a person that says publicly on their website, you know, all the bad things about the kitchen design industry in your area, you are addressing all the positives that you bring to it. You see, yes. like I'm, I'm yeah. seeing that juxtaposition. So if I'm, when mm -hmm. I'm, when I notice, and that's what I want you to describe for us, because when I have the background information from Michael, how mm -hmm. dire the reputation for kitchen designers is in the UK, and then I go to your website and I go to the other corollary information that I find on you, I keep seeing words like integrity and yes. care and, you know, your family is the, is going to live in this kitchen and I want, you know, blah, blah, blah. So mm -hmm. I thought that was, I specifically noticed I thought instead of saying are you tired with all the lousy kitchen designers out there <laughs> like you took the other way and just keep showing so if I'm a UK um, homeowner homeowner in the South Wales and I'm oh. fed up yeah. I might find you and be like oh these are all the things I want a kitchen designer to be so that's that's what I noticed and it and I have what I'm asking is is that intentional yes okay I, I, I think sometimes there's so much bad press um, that you, you need to keep a positive spin, especially right. when it comes to your marketing, because they haven't, you know, you, you read some content on a website and they haven't actually met me yet. So it, it, it's quite, you know, it, it, it's quite a difficult thing to explain one, what you do to how you're different to everybody else's around you. And three, it's, let's not dwell on what, bad things that can happen let's think about the positive things that you know let, let, let's see where we can help you um so it, it you've got to keep a positive spin because there is so much um rubbish <laughs> can right? i say rubbish yes. oh yeah <laughs> uh, <laughs> and i think when it comes to um there's there's a massive difference between kitchen design and interior design kitchen design um there's a lot of companies in the area that seem to concentrate more on sales and I understand why they do it because obviously it, it, it is a selling machine they could have a massive factory to feed or, or whatever it is you know when it comes to manufacturing but they, they are salespeople. they're not designers first they are there they are employed to sell so so with that then they haven't got the time to spend with a customer to um to concentrate on the creative process so it's, so there's a lot of companies around here like that. So thankfully, my business model isn't. It, it's very much I have got the time to spend with people, and and I think and I think when it comes to the qualification side of it as well, and because we've written um, a, a a post in the there's there's a nationwide uh, review kbb review magazine that goes out to all the retailers. Obviously, the public doesn't read that. It's mm. all for the trade. 
And we, we wrote um, a, a very controversial article about qualifications in the kitchen industry because it's only recently in the last, I think it was three, maybe four years maximum. Four years ago, they brought in a kitchen design qualification in one university in Buckinghamshire. Hmm. And um, I think they tried to roll it out in France first, but it didn't particularly work. So <laughs> they huh. brought it here. <laughs> <laughs> Let's uh, give it whether, to them. <laughs> <laughs> whether it's working or not, I don't know. But it, it, it's 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 something in the right direction because people just look at kitchen design as if it's just a kitchen. But there's so much involved and there's so much that goes into it that um, to the public, it was always very much, well, I need a new kitchen, or just, just a couple of boxes on the walls type attitude, whereas it has evolved, I'd say, in the last five years, what it is being deemed more important. And I think because of my educational background, I've got a furniture design degree. Um, and then, you know, I, I, I was privileged to study in Finland for three months with, with, with the university out there, which was an amazing experience. And, you know, you bring that philosophy and that ethos back and you can see how the Scandinavian countries sort of work. And it's it's so different to here. And it, it gives you that drive of thinking, right, there, there is better out there. Mm. Um, but a lot of kitchen companies, I think it's, it's a lot to do with the time. You know, I'm not saying that if you don't have a qualification that you're a bad designer you mm -hmm. might be a very very good designer but I think time restraints whereas you've got your manager behind you going you you know you're not hitting your target you've got sell 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 so that's the bad press I think but what I'm finding with the uh, the kitchen design I don't think it's a degree but it's some sort of equivalent qualification that a lot more design graduates are coming into the system now, which we do need because they've got the creative flair. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been enrolled in in a, in a degree of of that sense because it's it's quite it's quite a difficult thing to go through. But but for me, because of where the bespoke side comes out of is, I've made my own furniture, so I understand construction, and I think you have to understand construction to design it. There's so many um, plans I see. They've got floating islands. And I'm just like, well, yeah, but how is that designed? And I'll see the plan. I'm thinking there's no way that's going to hold up. <laughs> <laughs> so it's quite laughable. And you explain this to a client. And I just sort of said, they've just made it look pretty. <laughs> they've, they've got no no concept of how that actually works. So that's, right. that's bells and whistles, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Quite time. Or smoke and but, mirrors is what I mean to say. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah the, so so the, the, there are a lot of interior designers or or they've studied maybe interior architecture at university so so that's come into the industry which is fantastic so because i deal with a lot of architects and a lot of plans you need to know how to read them mm -hmm. read the plans read the elevations and and then you you, you know you've got to have the, the the basic i'm not saying a lot of know-how but the basic know-how of, of speaking to structural engineers and the builders because more often than not i'm on site Right. And I, I'm the one I'm I'm the communicator between the builder and the client. So the builder has to explain to me what's what, what's going on. And then I've got to explain it to the client in layman's too. <laughs> right. Right. He, he you and him this, talk technical, but you've oh, got to make yes. it, you know, English for them. Yes. Yeah. Because to a client, I've, I've got I've got I've got some fantastic clients at the moment, and two are musicians, and one's an international violinist, and the other one's a, you know is a cellist, and they've got no idea about building work, but right. they don't want to know. Right. You know, well, they, that's the whole point, right? <laughs> they've got busy lives. They've 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 got a, a beautiful daughter. They've got busy lives, and they bring me in just to take all that stress off them. Right. right. Um. So then I'm just going right. This is what's happening today. This is what's going on. Um. Is there anything you want to you know give input on is there anything that you know this this and this is anything I've forgotten because obviously I'm on site tomorrow Do, so it's just constant communication with the client and and they just love it they just know that I'm dealing with it Get you're handling it. it you're handling it yeah well what I like about this whole approach that you bring to it is is that instead of being there in South Wales and saying, well, you know, the kitchen industry is shot here. The big box stores, the big shed stores have mm -hmm. ruined it. They have put this whole spin and this whole stereotype on it of fast sales, fast moving, no, low service, low quality, poor workmanship, poor design. So how can I compete with that? What I love is that 
that's all happening around you and instead <sighs> that you are just saying, well, what is it that I'm doing that they're not doing? Okay, so they're mm -hmm. doing fast sales. Well, I'm taking my time. I'm interviewing you. I'm listening. I'm understanding what your needs are. Okay, so they're doing poor quality workmanship. Well, I understand the design of furniture and I'm going to make sure it's designed well. You know, so I just really think that it's, you know, because so many of us get stuck in when something is bigger than just one or two things. And it does mm -hmm. sound like in the UK that this is bigger than just one or two um, things, that it is sort of a stereotype and oh. it is sort of a a known phenomena that, you know, kitchen design has got a bad rap. And so instead of like giving in and kowtowing to it, uh, you know, you lean in and you rise above and you, the thing is what you do is you are consistently expressing what the negative is that's happening, but instead of saying this is the negative, you're looking at the other side and saying, what would be the positive of that? If that negative was, was removed, what would be the positive? And then all of your marketing is talking to that. It's very smart. Yeah. Yeah. That's what we, we've tried to do. Cause I think if you, I think with any industry, I think if you dwell so much on the bad, you'll start going down that road as well. Mm -hmm. So I, I think you've, you've got to keep upbeat and you've, you've got to, you've got to just stop being distracted by, by the noise mm -hmm. of what's going on around you and just concentrate and focus on what you're about and what your USP is. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Cause, cause at the end of the day, as much as it's creative and I love what I, what I do it's still a business. So it's a business that, yeah, we're all out to earn a living and provide for our children and pay the mortgage. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so, you know, we have to look at it as, as a business as well. But you, I think with this industry, you have to put your heart and soul into it. Mm. Otherwise it's just, it's just not going to work. Mm. But I think because, because people, your clients will feed off that. They'll feed off your passion and they'll get excited about it. Right. Um, and that's, and that's what, that's what I try and go for, for every single project that I'm on. Now, what happens, Joe, is your website, um, designed in such a way, like I see it, I see that it's beautifully designed and everything else, but is it clear to the consumer that might be, you know, sitting there at 10 o'clock at night, Googling kitchen design that really thinks they are looking for the, you know, wham, bam, thank you, man, kitchen design from the box store. Okay. But if they come to your site mm -hmm. and they think, oh, you know, that's interesting. If they make it as far as reaching out to you and you have a conversation with them and it's clear to you that they do not have the budget, they, are, they, have, they have knocked on the wrong door, that they want the Wham Bam Kitchen because of their budget and their lifestyle or whatever their value system is, how, do, for, what I'm asking is twofold. Mm -hmm. Do they even make the contact to you or is it so clear from your marketing and your website that they're like, oh yeah, that's, that's probably not what I'm looking for. Or if they do make it as far, what happens in that conversation when you're, when you're speaking with them and you realize that, you know, they, they are really not your ideal target client and they cannot or will, it's not always that cannot afford, but will not put the value in affording it. H how do you deal with that? Well, or does it not happen? Are you positioned no, so well now that people that are tire kickers that really have no intention of wanting a custom designed bespoke kitchen, do they just not mm -hmm. call you because your marketing is so clear? I, I think I, it, it's got it. <laughs> the website is a, is a bit of a sore subject, I think, in our house <laughs> uh -huh. because we, we've we've been tweaking and adding and taking things away in the last, you know, the, there's a massive um uh, well, technique to a website and i'm not professing to say that we know everything because we don't but you know we are constantly tweaking our website trying to make it better trying to make it clearer for clients and i think the look of it now looks you know fairly mid to high end type mm -hmm. styling which mm -hmm. hopefully like you call them the the tire <laughs> the the tire kickers <laughs> right right that they just go yeah. uh oh i'm in the wrong spot <laughs> yeah so it doesn't i th i think you know we we look we look at so many websites and we try to sort of say right what does that what does that say to me and there's a lot of websites that look oh it sounds awful cheap and nasty right. and then some possibly if people's budgets are not quite where they need to be for what i can give them as value that they would be more targeted towards 
that type of website than to mine. Um, but obviously, even even my clients that do um, have a nice budget, they will still they will still ask me about costings, one hundred percent, right? Because they still are not quite sure if they can afford me. Because I think when when people start looking at oh designers, oh ooh, you know that sounds expensive, or project manager, oh that 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 sounds expensive. But the thing is, once I explain, maybe, maybe and it's very very hard to do that in words on a website because right. it can be too wordy and too preachy, and and and, all, and I don't want to come across like that. That's why I try and invite people in and we sit down, we have a coffee, have a couple of biscuits, <laughs> cookies. Um, Let me you in, know. get you into my. <laughs> web <laughs> oh, i'll be the size of the house but um yeah so we, we sort of sit down we have a coffee and i sort of explain to them that i add value um to what they are trying to achieve and sometimes with certain projects that i'll save them money right i'll save them from really bad um really really bad ways of doing certain things and when i explain and to be honest with you i've had a couple of projects where um i've actually gone out looking at property with people so so on a couple of occasions i've gone out this sort of said look we're thinking about buying this property but we're not quite sure how much the re- refurbishment costs are going to be we want this this and this and i've i've gone out and i've actually spoken to the estate agent and i sort of said right how much is this uh, on the market oh we've had two asking offers already right okay and okay so in your opinion this sort of style property if it's done to a certain finish how much now is that worth um and it might be 20 thirty thousand pound more and I've, mm. I've turned to the client and i've sort of said i wouldn't i wouldn't buy this property right because we're going to put a hundred pounds into a hundred thousand yeah, pounds to make yeah, it decent said, right yeah i sort of said you know you you're looking at 40 to 50 even just to move in <laughs> so, so to, to be that, civilized yeah <laughs> there's no well, um, you know, you know, even if it's got because a lot of properties with the sort of the 1970s have got a lot of asbestos in it. So, mm. you know, that's, that's that's a costly thing to remove asbestos. So it's, it's a case of just giving them the right advice. Um, and with that right advice, that has saved them money. So if I feel I can't uh, add value to what they are trying to achieve i'll just be open and honest with that that customer so say look i i I don't think i can help you but what i would do is this this and this Mm. and i'll just give them advice because then hopefully if they've had the right advice for me i thought actually you know thank you for doing that rather than try and sell me something Mm -hmm. that um they'll remember that and they'll have that maybe that conversation with a friend of theirs that may need my help and can afford it right (laughs) <laughs> exactly but it's, it's doing it in a way that that's <laughs> not saying to customers you can't afford me you right, know right don't my time right. um it, it's it's just it's just giving them value of my time without and and i've and it's taken me a long time to learn that you know i was a busy fool for a long time thinking <laughs> i just wanted to help everybody okay. um and you, you just can't you just can't because, you know, you, you need to have a life as well. Um, you know, the hours that I work are just ridiculous even now. Um, you know, just think, oh, my two kids, you know, they're growing up without a mother. But it's um, but what I did before was, yeah, it, it is a waste of time. And you, you, you just learn your lessons and unfortunately you learn it the hard way. So that's a good point right in there because I know from the coaching that I do with interior designers that that is a tough thing to swallow. That's a tough bridge to cross over is to be sure of who you are and the design that you want to do and the type of project that you want to do and being okay to saying no to the client or project that's not right for you. Because, (laughs) yeah, I mean, you have to learn it. It comes with time. But the thing is what I often say, and you tell me if you back me up on this, is Mm. like if you say yes to one or two projects that you know aren't the right ones for you, when the good one comes along that's perfect, you're too busy to do it. And now you're like, ah, for crying out loud. (laughs) Definitely, definitely. And a friend of mine gave me some amazing advice. It was quite, quite a while ago now. And she said to me, if you feel it doesn't enhance your portfolio, so if you feel you you can't take photographs of the project when it's finished and you can't promote it, then why do it? Hmm. So I've got to the point now in my career, in the business, that I, I've actually turned work away. Right. Because even though there was money to be made, 
um, it just it just wasn't the right fit for me. Right. And I, I remember doing the email <laughs> because I couldn't do it over the phone because <laughs> I felt awful. Um, just doing an email to sort of say, look, you know, it's I don't think I'm the right. I, I don't think my company's the right fit for you. Um, you know, that, that, that type of conversation, which is very, very difficult, but I'd rather that than the stress on me. And then maybe the relationship might, may have broken down because I've got to be excited to do a project. Right. I, I, because you get the customers on board because at the end of the day, you're, you're putting with what I do, I'm putting a team of tradespeople in somebody's home it's not a property it's their home it's where they eat there it's where they spend time you know they make memories there and you have to treat that property with such a massive amount of respect Mm. and you know and all my all my team know they've got to be clean at the end of the day they've got to brush up they've got to be very civil to every you know there's a certain rule book that they have to abide to. I'm sounding mm. like a right taskmaster. <laughs> no, <laughs> but, you're sounding like a very you know, smart businesswoman is what you're sounding like because it's all you know, representative of your, of your brand. Of course, of, of course it's yeah. my company. That's you know, right. they are they they're an extension of me. Right. And they have to behave appropriately in every single instance otherwise they do not work for me again. Right. Um right. Uh, so yeah, but not that I've ever really been in that position thankfully um i might have been in one or two occasions but (laughs) (laughs) i've never used that person again but um yeah they are they are an extension of my of my company and they they get that which Mm -hmm. is really nice and they have the same amount of respect for the customers because they they realize that if that job goes really really well then we'll have another one that's right and they'll be on they'll be on that one so they, they, you know, it, it's it, it's a collaboration and it's a team effort. That's right. That's right. I love it. So there's something in there, though, that I want to pick apart a little bit. So mm-hmm. we know, we know that when you get to a certain level in your business that designer after designer has professed a similar sentiment that you have just expressed, which is say no to the project that you know is not right for you and you for your Uh friend your colleague who said if it's not portfolio worthy if you would not be proud of it then don't take it but the thing is there is this part before you get there like do you remember being a designer who did take the projects that you know were not right for you. And do you think, Joe, that it's it's not so much um, a matter of a business decision, but an experience decision where you finally just say, you know, this is the third time I took a project that wasn't right for me. And it's the third time that the project <laughs> is a hot mess. And, you know, either the project doesn't look the way I want it to look or the relationship didn't pan out the way it normally would, yada, 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 right? So mm. the thing is, is that comes with experience. When you experience the negative effects of working within and on projects that you know in your gut from the beginning you should have said no to. But my question is, how do do you think and do you think it's possible to teach a newer designer to do that from the outset or do you think we're all determined to have to feel the pain of that lesson before we're able to do it or do you think there's a way to really get through to somebody and say I know that you have no project in the pipeline and this woman just came to you but you know it's a wrong project say no what do you say do you say no maybe in the beginning don't say no or do you say take my advice and all of your colleagues that are so far down the line ahead of you just say no I'm very curious what you think we should be doing there I I think you've just got to feel the pain (laughs) <laughs> you, you have to go through your own experience and you, you have to learn by mistakes mm-hmm. and you will make mistakes right. but that's the only way <clears throat> excuse me that's the only way you're going to learn um i th- i think if, if if a new designer uh fell into uh, it depends if a new designer is just sort of rolled out of college and thought i'm going to start my own business mm. You know, that, that's one avenue, and that is, I think, quite a dangerous avenue to go down, especially in this industry. I agree. I, th- I, I think you have to work for companies. You have to see what they do when that's right, see what they do when that's wrong, 
um, take on board everything and you have to learn with experience and it's only from experience then you can get to a, a certain position where yes you can turn work away if it doesn't suit your your philosophy your ethos your values of your business um, but, but that's a long time coming and you have to <laughs> you have to feel the pain I don't, I don't know anyone that's gone into this industry and has got it right from the offset Right, right. It's funny I because I kick I it around in my head. I just, uh, I feel like there's so many designers that come on and express the exact same thing, that when mm. you know the client isn't right, don't take the client. So my brain goes to, well, why do you, as a newer designer, resist that? When you get that nudge, that you get that little voice in your head that says this one is wrong, why, as much as you're looking to make the money on the project, why can't you just go, you know, I've heard you know, 200 out of 300 designers say it on the podcast, don't do it. Do you know mm. what I mean? Like, it's funny because it, I can't go over, I can't go back and, and do it over again for window works. I mean, I know I mm. learned it the hard way too. Mm. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> but I didn't have 300 podcasts telling me to skip those mm. people. So mm. I, I, it's funny. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. I, I, I really struggle with it because I, th I, I think, think it's, I think Go ahead, yeah. I think sorry I think I think it depends on what position that person is in it depends what financial person you know position that you know maybe they have to take mm -hmm. the work that's that could um, be the right classification for the answer it's true because I recently did mm -hmm. have a designer and I and it was clear when I asked her point blank is your family dependent on the income from your design mm. firm? And she said, no. I said, then stop, stop yeah. taking anything, <laughs> you know, like, right. You have to, you have the luxury yeah. of that and you're right. Yeah. And so that might be the one difference that mm. really just look, I ha I, we are dependent on my income and you know what? I might have to just, you know, put my big girl panties on and struggle mm. through this project that is not my ideal project. So well, it's what, a tough well, thing. What yeah and I, th I think with my industry as well a lot of people like when it comes to the selling and the, the money's got to you know the cash flow's got to keep coming in is because in in my industry with especially with kitchens companies are taking on big warehouses mm. and then they fill in those warehouses with displays well we can call it displays but um <laughs> you know ideas for customers to to walk around and say oh i like that i, like, I don't like that um i find quite a lot of them to be to be honest quite uninspiring but um that's just me being me um <laughs> but tell but us how you really is, feel joe yeah, no. <laughs> you're getting to know me now she's getting warms uh, up michael i'm yeah. just saying <laughs> but, uh, but um so obviously big big areas is, is, is big rent Right. Then you've got to pay business rates. Right. And then each display really has to be um, changed over every two to three years. Yes, yeah, so, so that cost costs, effective. That, yeah. that costs money. Mm -hmm. And then you've got staff to pay. Then you've got, you know, insurances and goodness knows what. But where where we looked at it was um, I'm quite a big fan of property. And even though I was renting for three years in a design studio, I just thought, oh, you know, this is just dead. This is just dead rent. This is just a waste of money. Mm. So I started looking for property and I wanted to stay near to home because of the the children with the schools. And, and I didn't want to feel the pressure of being stuck in the car in traffic mm. thinking, oh, my God, I've got to pick the kids up. So right. I wanted to stay near to home. And we found a property in town that was completely dilapidated. It was just, oh, it, I wouldn't have had an animal live in there. It was absolutely shocking. Uh, and it's on three floors. So what we've done, we've created the ground floor into a design studio. And then we've put two apartments above. Nice. So those apartments pay for the mortgage. Nice. Which means I'm there rent free. Nice. So with that, then I don't have the, oh, I've got to pay the rent this month. Right, I haven't right, got right. that panic. So that's why I've got the luxury of spending time with my customers and nurturing them and and just you know sort of discussing ideas there's no pressure to right, sell right I love it um, and and that that for me that is the way forward because I do see a lot of buildings big buildings and I'm thinking wow how much are they paying on that and that you know and the worry then uh, do they sleep at night because <laughs> they're <laughs> worrying about the bills that they got paid and that's that's a hard that's a hard way to live when yes. you're that worry so I just thought do you know what I don't want that let's right. just take it away and as much as we 
we we had the sort of the pain and the stress of of, of developing this property it's it, it's it's ours mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know it's, it's, it's our investment so it, it's a good way to look at it in that way yes i i love it i mean the thing is you know it's funny because in one of the chapters of my book i express you know don't don't sell from need and what i mean mm. is your need you know what I mean? Yeah. You can't sell because I need to pay the rent. I need to make a car payment. I need mm. to do this. It's, mm. it's, you do need to do all of those things. Let's yeah. be clear, <laughs> but yeah. you cannot take your projects and you cannot price your projects and you cannot close projects when you're so focused on this, this like stress need. And mm. so there are different ways to overcome that. One of them is in our business model. I don't have the checkbook. I don't mm -hmm. look at the checkbook every week. I just go out and I do my thing. I sell. Mm -hmm. And so that's one way. For you, you've removed the burden of knowing that the mortgage, you know, you don't have to worry, will the mortgage be paid? So that if you sell a kitchen, if you sell a living room, if you sell a whatever, mm -hmm. you know, we're all good. The mortgage is paid mm -hmm. no matter what. But the concept is that, is that you have to find a way to be able to, as you said at the top of the show, to have focus on your client, to mm. listen to your client, to take notes about what the client wants, and to spend the uh, your client's money as if it was your own money. Yes. You know, these are all things that come into place when your head is in a free spot because you're running a well run business and it's profitable and you are with everyone's best options on the table and that's what you're striving for. And yes, so, definitely. and, and those include your own best options, right? You know, mm, so yes. I think it's great. I think it's, I think it's terrific. The biggest thing that I love from what you're doing, Joe, is that you're in the middle of an industry that is more than looked down on that is literally mm. in a crisis of identity as far as of, of not being a value and you mm. emerge from it and you talk specifically directly opposite to all of the things that are happening in that industry and you're thriving in it and I love it and I think it's so fantastic <laughs> no thank you yeah you're, really you're really that. doing a good job and it's uh you know look you have to then come across with the, the with the good quality kitchen design but the point is is that you're attracting that market that they're you know the whole does the whole market of kitchens in your area has got a bad rap but there are mm. those clients that want good quality and then want the value and want what you're bringing to the table and don't want the kitchen slapped up in a hurry mm. with no thought to it. And so instead of saying everybody here just wants that junk, you're really putting your stake out and saying, hey, for all of you that want full service, luxury, I'm going to pay attention, I'm going to take care of you, and I'm going to do a bang up job, you know, you're putting your, your flag out and saying, come to me. And I think it's awesome. Oh, thank you. Yeah, really awesome. It's a great lesson for all of us not to be afraid to niche into something is the secondary part of this is to not to be afraid to niche into this because you are, you know, you said flat out, you know, you might attract them with your kitchen design, but then you're very often going on to do the rest of the project with them. So yes. I yeah, love de it. Definitely. I love it. Well, I can't thank you <laughs> enough for spending your time. And I'm so happy that my UK <laughs> listeners have like a buddy here now. <laughs> <Yay>. <laughs> so I did have Polly uh, Williams from Camber Yard on, and she is a business coach in the UK that specializes in interior designers and creatives. Oh. She was on the podcast a year mm -hmm. ago. So we did have uh, her on, but you know, Hey, come on, you know, UKs, come on, come on, let's do do this <laughs> <laughs> definitely so definitely. i love it thank you so much joe and thank michael for me too for pushing you to do this <laughs> <laughs> pushing me yeah literally <laughs> that's it that's it so uh, you have a great day thank you thank you thanks It started two and a half years ago, practically from the first show, when Nancy Ganskaufer was on episode number 15. She told us niche is rich and broad is broke. And from there, we had Cheryl Janice in episode number 41 tell us how she niched her business to wellness design, and that's when her firm took off. 
Joe told us exactly the same thing today. Her marketing leads with kitchen designs, but she is a full-service designer. This doesn't hurt her, she told us. It brings her work. In the UK, it seems most kitchen design is done by the shed stores, as she calls them, and not by personalized high-level designers. Well, Joe and her husband, Mike, shout from the rooftops. If you want personalized, detailed, thoughtful design and service, they are the firm to call on. And from there, their clients continue with them long past the kitchen design. So what do you do really well? What can you lead with? Think about it. Tell the world about it. Build your reputation around it and then add services that your already satisfied clients can take advantage of. All right. Sounds like a good idea. All righty. There are (laughs) so many things coming up in the next month that I'm just going to have to run down them as a laundry list because if I gave you the details on every one of them, we'd be here 20 more minutes. So what I'm going to say to you is please go to luannnigara.com and go to the live events tab for the details on each of these events. Some of these we will be able to um, you know, post to our Facebook or our Instagram live feeds. Others I will not be able to. So please be sure to check out all of the details, all of the RSVP links for these events at luannigara.com. All right, here's a rundown. May 16th, I'm on a live webinar with the IDS virtual chapter at 1030 in the morning, Eastern daylight time. So here's the thing. If you're not a member of the IDS International Design Society, maybe you want to check it out and see if you can get in on this. May 17th, I'm with Blanche Garcia for the the Designers Power Brunch in Montclair, New Jersey. That's a live event happening in Montclair, New Jersey that I'll be at. May 21st, Nancy Ganzikaufer will be at my showroom at Window Works in Livingston, New Jersey for our monthly mer- lunch and learn. That is going to be awesome. If you are local, come to that. May 22nd, I will be with LaFroy Brooks for opening night at the ICFF in New York City at the LaFroy Brooks location in the A&D building. This is going to be a book signing and a networking party. Please make sure you get the RSVP link for that on my website. On May 23rd, I'm going to be on a live webinar with the Window Coverings Association of America National for a live lunch and learn. Are you ready to be a business owner? Come and see what I have to say about that and let's see if you're ready. And then, oh my goodness, in July, I'll be at Las Vegas Market. Details coming. Okay, so I don't think there's anything for June yet. But May is pretty uh, jam-packed, and I really do hope you will stay in touch with me and make sure you get in on any of these that you're available to. When you go to the website, if there's something missing, just give it a day, come back a day or two later. They will all eventually be on my website, all the details, okay? So um, I think that's it. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, And I do want to say this before we go. If you are one of the many designers who has already read my book and left a review on Amazon, I just want to say thank you. I really do appreciate your kind words. I read every single review, both on iTunes and Amazon. Uh, I mean, think about it. Is there a review that you've got anywhere in your planet for your design business that you haven't read? No, no, we read them. This is this is the juice that keeps us going, right? I'm just exactly like you. So um, what's interesting is you guys say to me when you read the book that you hear my voice in the book. Well, I want you to know I hear your voice in the reviews, and I thank you. I thank you a real lot. All righty. Have a great day and decide to be excellent. Thank you so much for joining me again today. This podcast is a production of Window Works, your resource for custom window treatments and awnings. To learn how we can help you on your next interior design project, go to www.windowworks-nj.com. And if you're interested in working with me on your business, either through masterminds or one-on-one coaching, or you want to know how to get my book, The Making of a Well-Designed Business, or you just want to know what's going on 
in the podcast land and where I'm going to be. All of that is found at LuannNigara.com. Thank you so much. Have an excellent day.